Uh, my name is Asim Agarwala. Um, uh, uh, this is joint work with Ziwei Liu, Raymond uh, Yi, Xiaowu Tang, Yiming Liu, and, and myself. Uh, Ziwei is the one who really did the work here. Uh, he was my intern at Google uh, last summer, uh, but he couldn't be here for a visa reason, so I'm going to do my best to channel his much greater knowledge on the project. Um, okay, so the problem we're addressing is one of video interpolation. Uh, given two frames of video, we want to hallucinate a new frame in between the existing pair of, of video frames. So for example, we could take a 15 frame per second video and make it 30 frames per second, or we could uh, simulate a slow motion effect. This is a pretty common task in, in video and visual effects. It's also surprisingly challenging. So a lot of things can actually happen in a 15th of a second. Uh, objects can occlude and disocclude each other, objects can deform, lighting can change, fast motions can happen, so we really need to be able to model all these rather complex effects that can occur in real video. So there's really two approaches to solving this problem. On the right uh, are flow-based methods. This is how they're usually done in, say, commercial tools to address this problem. So you compute optical flow, and then you simply advect the RGB values along the optical flow values and composite them uh, to create an intermediate frame. This works well when optical flow works well, but as we all know, flow doesn't always work uh, super well. So another more recent ap approach is a hallucination based. So here we use a deep network to directly hallucinate the RGB values of in-between frames. The nice thing here is we can use all the machinery of deep learning and we can train it in an unsupervised fashion by just dropping every other frame of an existing video and then using it as supervision. The problem here is that uh, it's a, the appearance of RGB frames is very multimodal, and so uh, these deep networks often produce very blurry images when trying to synthesize uh, entire RGB frames. So we hope to achieve the best of these two approaches. We want to also train in an unsupervised fashion on any existing video, but it's much easier to copy pixel values from neighboring frames than it is to hallucinate them. So we want to use some sort of optical flow representation. So the representation we're going to compute uh, we call voxel flow. So given this intermediate frame that you see here, uh, at each pixel, we're going to compute an optical flow value, uh, delta x, delta y, uh, and we're going to assume it's symmetric in time, so the flow backwards in time is the negative of the flow forwards in time. Uh, and then we're also going to compute a third value, z, which is a mask. It's a value between 0 and 1, and it just says how to linearly blend the color from the earlier frame and the color from the later frame. Uh, this is an intermediate representation, so we have no supervision on optical flow. It just helps us compute the final RGB values. To compute the final RGB values, we actually use uh, bilinear interpolation in these two, uh, the earlier and the later frame, because these floating point, these optical flow vectors can be floating points, and so we need to compute an actual color. And then finally, we blend them linearly using the mask values, and that creates a final RGB value. So this deep flow representation, this voxel flow representation is really what enables our, our great results. So uh, we put them into a standard uh, encoder-decoder framework uh, along with skip connections. Uh, you can see the voxel flow here is an intermediate representation. It's used to compute a final synthesized frame. The whole thing is differentiable, so our supervision occurs uh, at the synthesized level. So we, uh, the loss function measures how well we reproduce the final image. Okay, so this simple approach works pretty well. Uh, but we found for very large motions that it's beneficial to compute at multiple scales. Uh, and then we take these multi-scale uh, deep voxel flows and we combine them in a final combination step to create a multi-res deep voxel flow. Uh, just as a small comparison between using single-res voxel flow and multi-scale voxel flow, uh, the single-res works pretty well, but there's some uh, fine details on the fast-moving brush that we get better with the multi-scale. Okay, so here is a, an example of one of our frame's results. So you can see the ground truth, uh, a direct hallucination method uh, using the beyond MSC algorithm, and ours. And we can see that our result is much sharper and pretty close to the ground truth. Uh, here is a video uh, where we've interpolated every other frame of a UCF sequence. Uh, as you can see, it's pretty hard to tell which frames are interpolated and which are real. Here's one more example. With fairly complicated motion of the horse legs, it still manages to do a good job. As an additional application, we can do uh, novel view interpolation. So we can't necessarily render arbitrary viewpoints, but we could take two existing viewpoints and just interpolate between them. So here we show on the left two ground tooth frames in the Kitty uh, data set. On the right is our result. And in the middle is a appearance flow algorithm, which also has a differentiable flow layer. 
uh, for novel view synthesis, you can see some of the structures on the left, such as the uh, signposting, is much wavier in the appearance glow result. And ours looks pretty good. Uh, here's a video where we've interpolated every other frame of a kitty sequence. And one more. Okay, so how good is our optical flow? Um, you know, it's not, our, our, our method is not trained to produce optical flow, it's an intermediate representation, but we can look at it anyway. And we can see that if we don't fine tune it, uh, it does okay, but it's not a great optical flow algorithm. But if we add some additional flow supervision and fine tune it, we get pretty close to some of the best uh, deep learning methods. And then on the right, we can also take a look at uh, the, our bottleneck layer, which has learned some sort of representation of motion and video, and see if we can fine tune that to produce uh, uh, results on other supervised video problems, like action recognition. Again, we're doing a, a pretty good. All right, so we did a small user study. We showed users uh, one method on the left and another method on the right using a diagonal split. Then we played it again with the reversing of the order. Uh, and here you can see comparisons to a, a state-of-the-art optical flow algorithm, epic flow, as well as ground truth. So for example, on the booth sequence, you could see that our method beats op epic flow 100% of the time, uh, but, and it uh, beats the ground truth about 50% of the time. So here we're, we're doing pretty well compared to ground truth. On the park sequence, uh, there's a few examples where epic flow wins, but not many, and uh, ground truth is much better than our result. But you can see from many examples that we're, that we're doing nearly as well as ground truth, and uh, we're also beating up a flow in all of these examples. All right, finally here is a video of some high resolution results. So on the left we see the original video where we've dropped every other frame, uh, and on the right you see um, the interpolated view. So we can run at any resolution because it's fully convolutional, so these are very high resolution results. Uh, and as you can see, it's you know, quite jerky in the left and sort of buttery smooth on the right. Um, we can handle very large motions, complex occlusions and disocclusions, um, and we don't, you don't really see much in the way of artifacts. So this book that's about to come flying through is quite fast, but even as it passes the boundary, you'll see that there's no, no significant artifacts. One more sports sequence. All right, conclusion. So we've made significant problem on a challenging and important uh, and useful problem of video interpolation. Uh, we have a new differentiable voxel flow representation that's really at the heart of why the method works so well. Um, we train in an unsupervised way in arbitrary video, so the more videos we get, the better our algorithm becomes. Uh, thanks, and this is uh, some more information here. Questions? I have one simple question. I'm wondering how fast is your, is your method, for instance, runs in real time or? Right, so um, by the time we wrote the paper, it was running around one millisecond to produce a video frame, uh, which is pretty fast, but certainly not fast enough. We've been working on distilling and compressing the model, um, and we're, I think right now we're around 200 milliseconds or so to produce a single frame. Um, we'd like to go farther because I think where this really gets useful is on a mobile device. So for example, you know, if you shoot a burst photo set, you get, you know, uh, frames at 10 or 15 FPS, put that into a video, it gets really jerky. Um, it's nice to, be nice to make those buttery smooth right on the mobile device. So we hope to do that. Okay, any other questions? Oh, in the, okay, it's not working. Uh, it's fantastic work. My question is, in one of the example classes park, ground two seems to win all the time. So wonder if you can mention failure case limitation, what's the assumption yeah. that's causing this? Yeah, so on the project website, actually, we link to all those results so you can find them. So where we have the worst trouble is on very repeating patterns, uh, especially vertical railings for some reason. Uh, it, it, it can kind of choose the wrong like, um, interval of vertical railing to pick and you get kind of flashing. 
Um, we don't really have a temporal coherence term, so it usually works pretty well, but it's, it's not necessarily choosing between these very similar patterns in a consistent way across time. Um, vertical patterns, also just generally, you know, very strong patterns uh, can introduce some flashing. Um, very, very large motions, very fast motions. Um, it can also not find it, but then again, it's moving so fast anyway, your eye doesn't really pick it up when you play it back. So I'd say the biggest artifact are vertical railings. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank speaker.